Welcome back. It's time for Project 8, Numerical Integration. Actually, Numerical Integration is only a piece of what we're doing, but it's an important piece. The context we're going to use this time is the large amplitude pendulum. So the idea is we have a pendulum that's not got a small amplitude, so we can't use the small angle approximation, but it's got a large amplitude. So let's, let's take a look at that. A pendulum is just a mass on a string. And uh, in this case, it's a point. We're going to treat it as a point mass, although technically it's not. Uh, and it makes some angle from the vertical. And it has a length of, there's a length of string L there. And the idea is the thing swings back and forth under the influence of the weight of the mass and the, uh, and the tension in the string. Now, the tension in the string produces no torque. So what that means is that when you write out the momentum principle, that the rate of change of the angular momentum is equal to the net torque, the only force that produces any significant torque is the weight. And uh, if you work it out, the weight produces a torque, mgl sine theta, in the opposite direction of the angle. So the rate of change of the angular momentum is, of course, the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. And so you get an equation of motion. Now, that equation of motion has a sine of theta in it. So what that means is um, it's, it's uh, hard to solve, basically. Now, we often make the small angle approximation in which the sine of theta becomes approximately equal to theta. And then we proceed to solve that guy in the small angle approximation. We assume solutions of the form cosine omega t uh, times some amplitude. Now, uh, I want to point out the notation there, theta double dot, is a physicist's notation for the rate of change of the rate of change of theta with respect to time. It's just shorthand for the second derivative with respect to time. And uh, if I calculate the first derivative of this proposed solution, I get minus omega times the sine of omega t times the amplitude. And if I take the second derivative, I get minus omega squared times the amplitude times the cosine. Well, that was the original solution. So that means what we have here is theta double dot is minus omega squared times theta. The momentum principle gave us that theta double dot is minus g over L times theta. So to make those guys happy with each other, that means omega squared has to be g divided by L. And that gives us a solution in the small angle approximation. And from omega, you can go back and work out um, the period. So the period is 2 pi divided by omega. Now, the thing is, we want to deal with a large amplitude case where the angle is not small. And so one way would be to go back and try to solve that differential equation. That's not the approach I'm going to take today. We're going to do something different. We're going to use energy considerations. So we're going to write out the energy of the mass. And uh, you can see it's a gravitational potential energy plus kinetic energy. And when the angle is a maximum, the kinetic energy is zero. So it means the energy is also mgl times 1 minus the maximum, the, the cosine of the maximum angle, or the, and that's just the amplitude. The amplitude of the oscillation is the maximum angle. So uh, what that means is I can write out the energy in terms of the maximum angle. I can write the velocity in terms of the rate of change of the angle. Uh, and then I can recast the whole thing in terms of angle, cosine of the angle, and the cosine of the maximum angle. And I get an expression for theta dot squared. Theta dot comes out of the velocity, and 1 half mv squared gives you 1 half m l squared, theta dot squared, and so on. And if you solve that for <coughs> dt, in other words, remember theta dot is d theta dt, so I can solve that for d theta. For dt, excuse me, I get an expression that involves d theta and the cosine of the angle and the cosine of the maximum angle. So the period of time during which the thing changes its angle a little bit depends on uh, its angle, and it also depends on the angle where you started the thing. You'll be going faster, for example, at the bottom if you started a bigger angle at the top. That's the idea. So the notion is to push on this a little bit and see if we can't find an expression for the period as a function of the amplitude. So if we integrate both sides of this equation from 0 to the maximum angle, 
uh, well, we integrate the right-hand side from zero to the maximum angle. In that, in that spans, when it goes from zero to theta max, that's going to be a quarter of a period because we recognize that when the thing goes through a full swing, it goes through four of those maximum angle displacements. It goes from zero to theta max, from theta max to zero, from zero to minus theta max, and from minus theta max back to zero. So that's four. So this is going to be a quarter of a period. So that means I can rewrite the period as four times that integral. So what we've done is recast the problem of the period of the pendulum into an integration problem. And that's why we're going to study numerical integration. So one of the tricks we're going to do in the code when we get there is to uh, perform this numerical integration. But I don't l like it written this way because this isn't really the standard way to write this integral. So what I want to do is to recast it to a different integral. And so uh, we're going to proceed to do that. I'll simplify a little bit here. I want to notice that cosine theta is nothing other than 1 minus twice sine squared theta over 2. So I'll rewrite the cosines here in that way, and I get a change where the cosines get replaced with squares of sines. Then what I want to do is to replace uh, theta with a different variable of integration. I'm going to factor out the sine of theta max over 2, and I'm going to define the sine of phi as the sine of theta over 2 divided by the sine of theta max over 2. Notice that's what shows up in the square root, 1 minus sine squared theta over 2 divided by sine squared theta max over 2. So if I define sine of phi to be all that junk, that square root is going to turn out to be a square root of 1 minus sine squared phi, and it's going to turn into a cosine of phi. It also means that phi as a variable of integration is going to go from the angle whose sine is 0 to the angle whose sine is 1. Because when theta is theta max, sine theta max over 2 divided by sine theta max over 2 is 1. So the sine of phi is going from 0 to 1. That means phi is going to go from 0 to pi over 2. So instead of integrating over a range that depends on the maximum value of theta, we're going to convert this into an integral that we always integrate from 0 to pi over 2 which turns out to be useful. The thing that's complicated is in this change of variables, if I go ahead and compute the differentials, they look pretty bad. Sine of, theta, uh, sine of phi has a differential cosine phi d phi. Sine theta over 2 has a differential cosine theta over 2 d theta divided by 2 because of the chain rule. And it looks like I'm going to have an ugly time trying to get all that fixed up. But uh, if I solve for d theta and uh, substitute back in in terms of phi and then move junk around I'll notice that d theta has all that junk and the sine squared theta over 2 divided by sine squared theta max over 2 is just sine squared phi if I replace all that I get this monstrosity things are looking pretty bad but I want you to notice that sine theta max over 2 and sine theta max over 2 cancel because they're in the top and the bottom and I got a cosine phi in the top, and I got a 1 minus sine squared phi with a square root in the bottom. That's the same thing. So those guys cancel. So actually, things are getting a little bit simpler. I end up with this beast. 4 times the square root of L over G times this integral. That doesn't look any easier than the thing I had before. In fact, it's impossible. You can't do it. But this is a standard form for an integral with a name. It's called the complete elliptic integral of the first kind. So all we've done is to transform this thing into a form that's sort of standardized. And uh, the thing, the sine squared theta max over 2 uh, in conventional notation is called m. And so I can rewrite this integral as k of m. It's a function of this m parameter. And uh, the m is just the factor of sine squared phi in the denominator. And you can see that we can rewrite the uh, period as 4 times the square root of L over G times this complete elliptic integral of the first kind of the parameter sine squared theta max. And it turns out if you do this integral for small values of m, you can expand that square root in a Taylor series. And you can show quite easily, in fact, that the uh, small m approximation of k of m is pi over 2 times 1 plus m over 4. 
if we put what m is in terms of theta max back in and we re-establish the small angle approximation, then uh, you can see that in the small angle approximation, not as small as the very small angle. So the very small angle approximation is when we solve the differential equation, uh, theta double dot is minus g over l times theta. In that case, we just get the one in this sum. We just get the one. We, we don't get the theta max squared over 16 term in that solution. If we go to the next step and do the small angle approximation on the complete elliptic integral, then we get the next term in the series, which is theta squared, theta max squared over 16. So that's an interesting result. Um, now what we're going to do is march ahead and look at some code, but I wanted you to see where those equations came from in terms of the conservation of energy and the equation of motion, and uh, we'll move on from there. Okay, so here we are looking at the notebook that I posted on the ACE website. And it basically, it goes through the same math that's in the slides. You can, if you follow this more easily, that's fine. It ends up in the same place, looking at the complete elliptic integral of the first kind, which we are going to begin to study with uh, Simpson's rule. So the idea is, how do I estimate the value of this integral for a particular value of theta max? Um, using some kind of numerical integration technique. And the first technique I want to discuss is called Simpson's Rule. But the, actually, before we do that, I'm going to start what turns out to be a fairly uh, time-intensive process, which is to import the video we took from the lab on Friday. So y that's going to take a while. So let me uh, get that started while we look at, um, look at this. So the way Simpson's rule work is, works is you grab a function, uh, you have limits of integration from A to B, you pass in the number of samples you want to take. Actually, this turns out to be the number of samples divided by 2. Because Simpson's rule is easier if, N, if the number of samples is even, what I do to ensure the evenness is multiply whatever number you pass in as capital N by 2 and use that as the number of samples. That way I know I get an even number. And then if the function requires arguments beyond the x-coordinate that's being evaluated, those arguments are passed in as a list here. Um, <clears throat> because the function needs to require uh, x-coordinates and possibly some other arguments, turns out I need to use the apply function from Python to apply an arbitrary set of arguments to a function. I'm going to create the samples here as a lin space. It's just an array that goes from A to B with 2n elements. Um, and the distance between samples, of course, is the difference between the maximum and the minimum uh, integration limit divided by the number of spaces between the samples, which is 2n minus 1. Now think about it. If you have 2n samples, you have 2n minus 1 spaces between the samples. Then this applies the function to those uh, x values and also uh, to any additional arguments that the function requires. And uh, I separate out the even samples, the odd samples, and according to the program for Simpson's rule, I multiply the odds by 2, I multiply the evens by 4, I tack on the first sample and the last sample, and then I multiply by the step size divided by 3. And uh, there's a lovely Wikipedia page that describes Simpson's rule and how those coefficients come about. Basically, the 2 and the 4 minimize the error in the integral for uh, some kind of arbitrary polynomial, and uh, it works pretty well. So I'm not going to get into the details of how those coefficients are chosen, but if you're curious, you can always come and ask me and we can talk about it. But it sort of takes us far afield, uh, so I'm going to move on. This is the integrand for the uh, complete elliptic integral of the first kind. m is a parameter, and we have 1 over the square root of 1 minus m times the sine of phi squared. It's an integral over phi. So phi is going to be my sort of set of x coordinates, if you like, for this integral. And then the complete, the complete elliptic integral only depends on m. It's equal to the integral of 
kint from 0 to pi over 2. So what I do is I call the Simpson's rule integrator. I pass in my integrand, 1 over the square root of 1 minus sine squared of phi. I integrate from 0 to pi over 2 with 1,000 steps. So I'm going to default to 1,000 steps here. And uh, I need an additional argument, which is the parameter. So you pass the parameter into the k function. It passes the parameter into the Simpson integrator as an additional argument beyond the, uh, beyond the phi variable, I guess, is how you can think about it. And, uh, and that's how that works. So let's compare the Simpson's rule integrator to the small angle approximation. Remember, when m is small, we figured out that <coughs> um, the first, uh, the complete elliptic integral of the first kind is pi over 2 times 1 plus m over 4 for small values of m. And we'll see that here in a minute. And then um, the other thing we uh, want to check is to compare against SciPy's built-in integrator. There's a built-in integrator called integrate.quad. Integrate is a module that has a bunch of integrators in it. The quad is an easy one that we can just immediately use. So uh, we're going to take the case of m function that uses the Simpson's rule integrator. We'll also test out the integrate.quad integrator, the built-in integrator, using kint. And, uh, and then we'll also compare it to the small angle approximation. If you put all that in, you get the interesting result that the small angle approximation actually works pretty darn well, up to about 40 degrees. <coughs> you can't even see the difference between the two, up to 40 degrees. After 40 degrees, there is a noticeable difference. But even as far as 70 degrees, it's, it's only about a 2% difference, 1.08 compared to 1.1. And notice also that uh, the very small angle approximation, of course, is that the period is equal to uh, the zero degree period for all angles, and even out to 70 degrees, there's only a 10% error uh, with that. So if you only care about 5 or 10%, then don't even worry about this. Uh, this is all in the noise. But if, uh, if you worry about a few percent, then you need to pay attention to the difference even between the small angle and the... Uh, and and the uh, complete elliptic integral. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a break from the elliptic integral business and go back and see if our video is loaded. And indeed, it is loaded. This is the video I took in class on Friday. And you guys can see that uh, we have a pendulum that's swinging back and forth here. And I've loaded it into the tracker software. And I just wanted to show, and you can see uh, we're not playing the video quite at full frame rate, but um, but you can see the way the thing goes. I need to create a coordinate system, and I need to set the scale of the coordinate system. So, uh, and the nice thing is you can zoom in and out here and move around. So let's start with the scale. Let's make a new calibration stick. And I know this thing is 24 inches. I stuck a, a level on the lab bench in class, and we know that thing is 24 inches long. So um, I'll set this up, and I'll and 24 inches, of course, is 60.96 uh, centimeters. I just happened to know that because I worked it out earlier. So I'll type that in, and uh, so that takes care of our our distance scale. Although for this experiment, the distance scale isn't as important as the coordinate system. So let's pick a coordinate system, and what I want to do is put the coordinate system up here at the uh, at the origin of the motion of the string. So let's zoom in here and let's let the string do its thing. There we go. Now it's going. Let's stop it when it gets somewhere close to maximum. And I want to put the coordinate system right about there so that the string points right at the origin and it looks like it's about the point where where it's gonna it's gonna be uh, going around. <clears throat> okay, so that's the main thing. Now to collect some data, what I want to do is back up until it's, there's a turnaround point. Notice we're at about 847. So the way you collect data is you make a new point mass object. So let's zoom in here. And let's bump ahead just a little. And what I want to do is to um, pick a point on the pendulum bob that's going to represent its angle. I want the angle that the string makes 
with the coordinate system. And so what I'll do, uh, I'm going to remember the frame number, 849. I'll go and create a new point mass. Somehow, whenever you create a point mass, it, uh, it bumps you back to zero. So I got to jump back to 849. Okay. There's, there's that point. So what I want to do is uh, hold down the shift key, that sh the cursor changes, and I want to click. Notice there's kind of a blur here. That's because we don't have a shutter on this camera. But if I pick a point in the middle of the blur, and I try to continue to pick the same point, it advances the frame for me. And you can see that creates, that's saving some data. Those are X coordinates. Now, um, the X direction in this particular case is the horizontal direction and the Y direction is the vertical direction. Of course, um, the whole video is sideways. I think it's because I took a vertically oriented video and the software wants a horizontally oriented video, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we can still get good data from it. And uh, so what we can do is save. I wanna export this data I want to choose a comma delimited file because that's easier for um, that's easier for the software to parse. I'm going to save it. Let's go ahead and save it to my Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox Physics 280 Projects Project 8. There's a data file called or data uh, directory called p8data, and since this was at uh, 8:53. I'm going to go ahead and let's see, I make sure I don't overwrite. I had one at 850. I'm going to call this uh, track, uh, track uh, 853.csv, save. And that should do it. Now that, so that's how you save uh, data from a single turning point. And let's go see what that looks like if we load that into the, into the code. Um, I'm going to go down here to the next cell after the project is described. There's another cell here. I'm going to replace this with track 853. And then I'm going to say go ahead and execute that. And notice what it does is it goes out and runs track 853. I know I've got the right track here. The point is this. At a turnaround point, at a turning point, the torque is almost constant. And that means the rate of change of the angular momentum is almost constant. And that means the rate of change of the angular velocity is constant, which means that the uh, angle is going to behave quadratically. So it's just like a constant acceleration motion of an object near, near the surface of the Earth. This is sort of like projectile motion. It's a nice parabola. The angle is going to reach a maximum and then turn around and come back. Um, <coughs> the angular velocity is changing at a constant rate. And what I want to do is to fit the data we collected by clicking on that tracker movie with the quadratic. And from that, I get the exact maximum angle and the exact time when the angle was a maximum. Even though we didn't sample that exact time, by fitting this to a quadratic, we get a very good idea of what when the angle was a maximum and what the maximum angle was. So I draw the crosshairs here to show you where the fit went. Um, and here we have the angle, 52.47 degrees. It's negative because it's below the axis, but uh, as far as amplitude is concerned, it's 52.47 degrees. And <clears throat> the, uh, the time when that occurred was 28.332, and notice it's very quite precise, um, based on the covariance matrix anyway. So uh, if anybody's interested in improving the uncertainties, they could do the Monte Carlo uncertainty technique we developed in Project 7, or no, Project 6, I think it was, um, <clears throat> if you like. Um, but anyway, that's, that's how we get data on the turning points, when and where the turning points occurred. Then uh, the other thing you might want to do is to go down to uh, low amplitude. So bop out, let's go ahead and delete this data, and then bop out to late in the video. Uh, we set it up so that the, the amplitude was very small. There I am at the very end. Let's go back just a little and play. You can see the amplitude here is quite small. So we can get uh, one P 
period of low amplitude motion. So again, you want to uh, create a point mass and then uh, go to the end and then go back a couple of periods maybe and then uh, let's just go ahead and zoom in and then I can show you the idea is to just track oh, at least a full period maybe a little more than a full period There you go, you get the idea. And what we really want to watch, we want to look at the angle. So this is the angle the thing is making. Again, you want to pick the middle of the blur. You can kind of see how this works. And anyway, you save this to a file and you'll end up with something that looks like my track full low amplitude and you can see it's a it's a lovely uh, fit to a, a cosine in this case we get the amplitude more importantly we get an offset the offset is just due to the fact that our coordinate system isn't lined up exactly with the pendulum and so there's an offset to the angle and this is important to get the correct answer for the amplitude in other words the amplitude is uh, well, in this case, we did a full fit to the wave function, so the amplitude is, uh, in this picture, it's about 7.5 degrees. But in this one, the amplitude isn't equal to this actual angle. It's this angle minus the offset. So um, you have to be a little careful about that. Anyway, uh, when you're done, what I'd like you to graph is the period divided by the low amplitude period as a function of the uh, maximum angle. This should actually be theta max. Go ahead and change that. So, okay, so uh, then we run this dude and you can see what happens is uh, I'm graphing the ratio of t to t0 versus theta max and <clears throat> notice that there uh, all the data appears to be sort of systematically below the line. Um, you can see the trend is right but uh, but there appears to be some kind of small but re reproducible systematic error here. The exact theory is way up here. The small angle approximation is the red line. It looks like there's a good agreement with the red line, but if you look back at lower uh, angles, you can see that really we're not... <coughs> we're tracking below the exact solution by about the same amount all the way out. So um, anyway, uh, and the very small angle approximation, which is basically the sophomore model where the period doesn't depend on amplitude at all, it's way the heck down here. Um, if, you, uh, if you only care about 5%, then the very small angle approximation is good out to about 50 degrees before you start running into trouble. Um, at 30 degrees, it's only a 2% error. So anyway, uh, I'll give bonus points for anybody who can identify and correct for the small systematic error. I think I know what it is. I think if you look at the video closely, you'll see the trouble. But uh, but I'm interested to see what you guys think. The other point is, um, what do you actually turn in on this assignment? I'd like you to actually go through the process of collecting data for a few of the turning points and adding them to our graph. So I get to see your data in addition to my data that I collected here. I want to see some of your data maybe down in here somewhere. And then the other thing I'd like you to do <coughs> is to take at least one full cycle of low amplitude data so that you'll make your own full cycle graph at the low end. Now, at the at, at large angle, it, the, the data doesn't represent, I mean, cosine is not the right function because at large angles, um, you have to use the full-blown, you know, complete elliptic integral theory and so on. Uh, but for small angles, you can, the, the small angle approximation at six degrees, you know, six degrees is, uh, it's way the heck over here somewhere. And then these two curves converge, and, and at that point, the small angle approximation is quite good. So, I mean, the very small angle approximation is quite good. And then the pendulum really does look like a, uh, a sine or a cosine, and you can do a full period fit. And it should turn out very nicely like this. Um, I'm very curious to see what your offset is. Your offset is going to depend on the details of how you place your coordinate system. So don't be shocked if your offset is different from mine.
but uh, your amplitude, uh, you know, should be on the order of six or seven degrees, something like that. But anyway, I want to see how you do that. I want to make sure you do know how to do it. So, uh, so that's the main thing. I, uh, if you guys have questions, don't hesitate to ask.